Amen. Stand up with me, please, and we'll read Scripture to see if all this is true. To see if all of these words line up with God's holy word. I ask you, Heavenly Father, to reveal to us today even a greater depth of the mighty work you did on Calvary's cross and what you have freely offered to us through an empty tomb. Oh God, as a believer, as your child, I want to know more about you. I believe that's the heart cry of every one of your family members. And I pray for those whose hearts are not there yet that somehow today they will be quickened or alerted, made alive so that they can recognize that there is no life outside of Jesus Christ, only existence. I pray for your word to be full and rich inside of us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Before you're seated, let's read a couple of verses together. I'm going to go to Romans. I'll begin with the first verse and you catch up at the third verse, okay? Romans chapter 1. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son. You want to join me now? There we go. It's not up there. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. From the dead. Amen. And just so you'll know, this is all foolishness if Jesus is not alive. Now we're just a bunch of fools. Hopeless, mindless, deceived, Religious fools, if he's not alive. But he is. And I know it from two sources. Number one, this infallible book says it is. Number two, I've experienced the resurrection power of Jesus in my life. I'm alive because of Jesus. You may be seated. Let's get a picture of Jesus on the eve of his uh, incarceration and crucifixion, and he's in an upper room with his disciples. And it's a solemn time for them. And in John 14, they've been talking a while, something has already happened. He has looked at Judas and he spoke directly and said, you go do what you have to do. And Judas got up and left and went out and betrayed his Lord. So Jesus is left with the 11. And in that 19th verse, Jesus said to them, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. He said it to them then. He says it to us now. He did not say, because I died, you will live also. Because a crucifixion and a death was a common thing back then. Just because Jesus was flogged and crucified and thorns were put on his head and he bled to death in public does not make him Messiah. It was a common thing for people to be crucified in those days. That's the way the Romans did it. As a matter of fact, on each side of Jesus was a crucified man. 
All of the roads in Rome leading everywhere were lined with people on crosses dying. So it is not the crucifixion that gives me life. It is the resurrection. It is because he lives that I live. Notice this. He wasn't the only one to be resurrected either. People were raised from the dead in the Old Testament. People were raised from the dead in the New Testament. Jesus did it. The apostles did it. The difference is when they were raised from the dead, they died again. But when Christ was raised from the dead, he lives forever. He will never die again. In him is eternal life. And that's what this is about this morning. Now please, mind you, Jesus never intended for his resurrection to be an annual religious celebration. He never meant for people once a year to get a little stirred up and actually get up and go to church. In fact, if you're visiting with us today, we welcome you, of course. We're glad you're here. Uh, and you might be thinking, well, they're doing all that special music for Easter Sunday. No, we're not. We do this every Sunday. We, we happen to sing a little bit more about the resurrection this morning, but we do the same thing on Easter Sunday that we do every Sunday because resurrection is not about a Sunday and you don't get prepared for just one Sunday. Resurrection is every day, all day long. Hey, don't talk to me about resurrection Sunday. Talk to me about resurrection Monday, resurrection Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Because it's every day Jesus died and rose again so that we could walk and live in resurrection power. This is my lifestyle. This is a manner of life. I'm not a hyped up religious person that happens to get happy that, that a leader died and rose again and his name is Jesus and we call it Christianity. That's hogwash. I'm alive because Jesus is alive. He's not just a leader that died 2,000 years ago and rose again. He is in this building right now. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in my heart and in the believer's heart. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in this building right now. That's what God would have me convey to you this morning that I'm supposed to be just as excited in the morning about an empty tomb as I am today. And I'm never supposed to weep at the foot of the cross. I'm supposed to rejoice because it was the cross that completed the work of salvation, the shed blood, the sacrifice of the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And three days later, that same lamb's sacrifice walked out as the victor over death, hell, and the grave. And that's what he means when he says, because I live, you will live also. After today, he said, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. See, there's something special about God's children, about those that believe on him, and that's the only way you can be a child of God. You are not a child of God because you go to church. You know, I'm going to preach all this old stuff. You know that. Uh, but I'm preaching to somebody besides some of you. You're not a child of God because you know some scripture. You're not a child of God because you know about Jesus. You're a child of God if you've been born again of the spirit that you've confessed that Jesus Christ, the son of God, has been raised from the dead and he has become your life. That's what makes you a child of God and there is a distinction between children of light and children of darkness, children of God and children of Satan. There's a, 
a biblically distinct difference between those who have hope and those who do not have hope. And, and one of those uh, instances in the Bible when Jesus was raised on, on that morning in, in the book of Mark, you have the two women coming to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. And they notice that he's not there. The stone has been rolled away. And in their shock and distress, in wonder and awe, they find themselves stunned. And the Bible says a young man dressed in white said to them, who are you looking for? They said, we're looking for Jesus. We don't know where they've laid him. And the young man said to them, well, He's not here. He is risen just as he said. And then that question, which I dearly love, why do you seek the living among the dead? <laughs> now this is the third time I've preached, okay? I'm going to let loose right here, right now. This is for me. This is for me. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He wasn't talking about physical existence there. You see, you can be alive and dead at the same time. You can get up and go to work tomorrow and make money and buy clothes and eat food and have children and all that and be dead. Dead in trespasses and sins. You're dead when you can't see God. You're dead when you have no heart for God. You're dead when all you see in life is success and money and all the stuff that the world is selling its soul to have. That's death. You can be walking around. You can be a billionaire and be a dead billionaire. So Jesus is saying now, there is a difference between the dead and the living. He made that distinction one time when a young man came up to him and Jesus said, follow me. The young man said, I certainly will. But first let me go home and bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, you come and follow me. He wasn't saying all those folks at home were laying down stretched out as a corpse and rigor mortis had set in. He was saying, let people walking around, getting a funeral ready, making money, let them, the dead, bury their dead. But you, if you want life, come and follow me. So there, the Lord makes a difference between the living and the dead, the hopeful and the hopeless, he is telling us that in the world there are two kinds of people, saved and lost. That's it. You're either saved by the blood of Christ or you're lost. When you're saved, you have hope. You know that no matter how bad it gets, Jesus is coming again. <laughs> no, matter how bad it, no matter how bad it gets, Christ has already gotten the victory. No matter how confused you may be, Jesus knows all about it. That's hope. And if all we have is hope, we're most miserable, Paul said. See, I'm hoping for a lot. I'm getting to the age and stage in my life that my, I'm getting my hopes up. I got some great expectations for the days coming ahead. I know that, here we go again, I cannot lose. I cannot be defeated. I will never die. You cannot destroy me. I can stumble, but I will always get back up. I might fall, but I will stand back up again. No weapon that the enemy has formed against me, and he's done quite a job at it at times, but it has no power to bring me down because I'm walking and living in resurrection power, and greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. That's the truth. I'm looking forward to a lot of things. I'm looking forward to living the rest of my life in fullness. And I don't even know what that means. I'm looking forward to a day when I'm going to hear a trumpet sound. Now, not everybody's going to hear it. No, it's not going to be for the whole world to hear. It'll be for those who are walking in resurrection and power and have their sins washed away. A trumpet's going to sound and poop, suddenly we're going to be gone in the twinkling of an eye. Jesus Christ is going to rapture his church. I'm looking forward to that. In fact, 
There's so much to look forward to. I'm just kind of high on life. Does that mean you don't have a little depression here and there? Nope. Does it mean sometimes you just want to walk away? You do. Does that mean I enjoy my Christian life? Not all time. It's tough sometimes. I don't like Christians. Sometimes. I don't like you. And you don't like me. Some of you all get tired of me. You get tired of hearing me preach. We all get tired of each other sometimes. But I know this. We've all been bought with a price. And as different as we are and as aggravating as we can be and as different as our lives are, we have one thing in common. Because he lives, we live also. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I've been trying to think about what it must have been like that night when the light began to turn on for the disciples in that room with Jesus. You see, it's in chapter 13 that they go into the room. And then in John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 all take place in the room that night. You see, the chapters and the verses get us all mixed up and we think that it's a different time and a different place. And No, he said all of that in those four chapters that night so he sat them down. They bring the elements for the, the supper, the bread, the wine. Um, they do a little talking, a little fellowshipping. That's when Jesus said to Judas, you do what you have to do. Judas leaves. There are the 11. And then Jesus said, may I paraphrase, fellas, I got to go. And it began to dawn on them. They've heard him say this for three years. The Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of wicked men and crucified and buried. And on the third day he will rise again. They heard it over and over again, but it never registered. But when he said, in just a few hours, I'll be gone. They went, whoa, what? Yeah. We didn't think you really meant that. But see, this is the man they believed in. And they believed in him so much that they quit their jobs. They left their businesses. Some of them walked away from their families that thought they were fanatics. They gave it all up for Jesus. He said, I have chosen you, you are mine, and through us the kingdom of God will come and advance. And they thought, yeah, that day's on the way. But now he sits there and they're hiding in that room. They are in that room with the doors locked because there's a price on their heads. The religious leaders in Israel want them dead. They are paying off Roman soldiers to kill them. We gave up everything and we are in trouble and we could be killed tonight because of you and you say you're going to leave us? I must do this, he said. But listen to these promises. This is what I give to you, he said. I'm going to leave. But I'm leaving so I can prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will come again and get you and take you to be with me where I am. Then he said, don't panic. This is not over. You think because I'm gone, the gospel won't be preached? You think miracles won't take place? No, that's why I called you, to do it in my absence. And I am telling you right now, that when I leave, you are going to do greater works than we have done. More people are going to be converted, more lives saved, more miracles take place, more people raised from the dead, more, more, more than you can possibly imagine. 
Because I'm going away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he will come and live inside of you and will never depart. I came, I'm going to leave a little while. But I'll send him and when he gets here, he will never leave you. He will not walk away. He's here. And he's going to hang on to you and help you till I come back to get you. So let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Whatever you see happening is just temporary. It's going to pass. It's the Father's plan. He's completing his way. This is God's will. I must do this. And what they didn't realize is that while they were cowering in that room after the crucifixion. They all hid. You know that, don't you? That's why they were behind closed doors. Hiding. They felt lost and empty. Uh, uh, neglected. Confused. There they sat. They had no idea what was going on in the underworld. They had no idea that their leader had left them to go down into hell and break the back of Satan and destroy the power of death. The, the price of sin had been paid and now Jesus was finishing it all up. Between the prophets of old, the Old Testament saints, he had gone down to where they are. He revealed himself and said, I'm the one you wrote about. I'm the one you preached about. And the Bible says on that resurrection Sunday, the graves popped open and people who had died in the Lord got up and walked around Jerusalem. People saw them walking around. He opened up hell and he took all the captives of hell out. He sent them on to heaven and then went over and surprised the apostles and said, I told you, didn't I tell you not to be afraid? I am alive. There is nothing to fear. Death is defeated. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You ever noticed that everything the human race does, it does with death in mind? Everything we do, we do knowing we are aging and time is getting away. The first Adam disobeyed God and brought sin and death into the world. Death loomed over the human race. Death is not just a body in a box. Death is the, the existence of the unbeliever. It's in our genes. We are born into death. Just like we're born into sin. And everything the world does without knowing it, they do with a sense of panic. They have to do it before they die. When a baby is born, they get shots right away. Have you noticed that? Everything we do, we do to prevent or prepare for death. So we give babies shots to prevent a disease or something from taking their life prematurely. Everything we do. You know, we, as I've said already, we spend trillions upon trillions of dollars all over the world every day to prevent death. Safety belts. All kinds of safety measures. Eating right. Vitamins. Workout plans. How many of you had this year? All that stuff. Because it is in the human thinking that we don't have forever. And then when you get to that place, you, you know, all you got to do really, you look in the mirror, hold up your graduation picture, <laughs> and look in the mirror at the same time. You know what that is? That's death. Death creeping closer and closer and closer. You know how you used, ladies used to look at your face and say, oh, how smooth that is. And now you're saying, my God, my God, what's happened here? <laughs> yeah. Fellas, you used to take your shirt off and go. 
heard you. Used to. Now you take it off and you go. Death. Death. Then you realize you can't prevent it. So you start preparing for it. So you buy a plot. <laughs> Might as well. It was at the first service this morning, a man came up to me. I'm just trying to get my mind on the East Resurrection Sunday, Easter Jesus. He said, hey, is it, is it okay in the Bible to be uh, cremated? I want to say, why are you, Easter? Why? But then I thought, he's got it on his mind. What do you think, pastor? And I told him what I thought. I said, I don't worry about it. I'm just going to. I'm not worried about it. He said, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to get things lined up here. <laughs> oh, we may be doing a funeral before long here. <laughs> there won't be a casket. it be a pretty little jar, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Preparing for death. So then you think, well, I don't want my kids fighting each other over my money. So I'll have to make a will. So you start making out a will. And you say, I'm giving this amount to this son because I like him. <laughs> he was respectful and nice, and he calls me ever so often to check on me and see how I'm doing. That one, mm, I don't know about that one. <laughs> he only calls when he needs something. So he ain't getting as much as he's going to get. I got to do this thing. Preparing to die. So I'm not going to lose control here, but I feel fire in my bones. So what the disciples did not understand, that while they were cowering in a dark room, thinking about possibly dying, being killed, Jesus was in the heart of the earth, and he was breaking the power of death. And when he came out, he said to those who believe in him, never again will the thought of death control your life. Never again will you look into a mirror or anything else and think it's just about over. No, because I live, you may be getting wrinkled and you may be wearing out, but something is happening on the inside of you. The shell, the outer covering is aging and it is wearing out. But the real you on the inside is getting younger and newer and stronger every day. Because I live, the real you is going to live forever. So that's why I stomp, I spit, I scream, I spew it like this. I cannot die. I will not die. I have eternal life abiding in me. Jesus Christ has set me free from the bondage of sin, death, hell, and the grave. Hallelujah. Man, that was good. I love the way Paul taunted death. He bowed his shoulders and he said, oh death, where is your sting? Bring it. Oh grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's as if, it's as if death were a wasp. And Jesus took the stinger out of it. So it can buzz, sound like a wasp, look like a wasp, threaten like a wasp. But when he lands, he just, he can't hurt you. That's death. It's all around us. You can smell it everywhere you go. People are dying. Dreams are dying. Just death everywhere. But I'm alive. And I know that when I draw my last breath and I blink my last blink, the next time I open my eyes, I will see him. Hallelujah. Him. Because 
I live, you will live also. Please understand me when I tell you that all your sins are forgiven. You are in this because you are a new creation in a new world because of a new birth. Now, I kind of stuck my foot in my mouth last night at the service because I got in a big way. And I said, folks, all this stuff around me, I don't even care about it. The trouble this nation is in, I just, I just, I'm just not that concerned. And I said, I guess that makes me look apathetic and irresponsible as a citizen. But, but you got to understand, this is not my home. Did I say this at the first service? Nobody, nobody redecorates a motel room. <laughs> nobody in his right mind checks in at the Holiday Inn Express and says to the desk keeper, where's the nearest interior designer? I need some painters. How long are you going to be here, sir? Oh, three or four days at the most, but I don't like it the way it is. I want to change some things. <laughs> Nobody pays that kind of money to have the walls stripped and painted. Nobody gets new bedspreads and new carpet to put down in a motel room because they're just going to be there a little while. Can I just tell you something? Or do I even need to tell you what I'm about to tell you? I've been in a motel room for 67 years now. I'm not about to call in an interior designer, spend my money, my energy, my time on making this any better. I'm looking to check out of here any day now and go to my brand new mansion in the sky. I mean what I'm saying. I'm living in him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life, I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In him, we live and move and have our being. We were buried with him, crucified with him, buried with him, planted with him, raised with him, and going to be with him. That's my hope. That's the life of living in the resurrection. And one more thing. When you get to the place that you're not consumed with this world and you can actually put your attention on things that matter, things that are eternal, things that do not change, it will absolutely transform the way you look at people Problems, situations, everything. Here's what Paul said in Colossians chapter 3. I'm not going to preach much longer. If then you were raised with Christ. How many could raise a hand and say, that's me, I've been raised with Christ. May I see your hand? If then you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right, right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died. You died. When? When you believed in Christ, you died. Actually, Let's get really theological here. You died when he died on the cross. 
because he already knew your name. You died, and your life, wait, how can I be dead and have life? That's what I've been preaching on all morning. You died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, as I close, because I know some of you have Easter lunch reservations. <laughs> You've been doing this since... I see all that, see? <laughs> this is what I know. I have, I have read these scriptures. I have cried over these scriptures. I have rejoiced. I've danced along over these scriptures. I have preached them. I have sung them. I have done my best to live them. And here's what I now conclude at this stage in my life. What you ponder becomes real to you. What you think about becomes a reality to you. That's why the scriptures teach, set your mind on things above. When you do, heaven becomes real. Jesus becomes more real. Eternity becomes steadfast. But if you ponder what is out there, what you see, what they are doing, that becomes more real than the real thing. Do you hear me? I believe that's why we have so many Christians kind of living like this, you know. They get happy in church, but when they leave church, it's a struggle, it's a fight. It's always a, 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 they have a tempest of the soul, a struggle of the spirit, always in a bind, always upset. It's because they've been looking at things on this earth, listening to things on this earth. You will not find one place in this entire Bible that gives you permission to think the way you used to think. Live the way you used to live. Talk the way you used to talk. Not one. You say, but I live here. How else can I? You will know how. I cannot stand here and explain it, but I know this. If you set your affections on things above, things above will become more real than things below. And if you are not careful, if you look at that junk and listen to that mess, you'll believe Satan's lies quicker than you'll believe the truth of God. If you want to be, as we say, on fire for Jesus, you've got to look up. You've got to think on things that are pure, and just, honest, lovely, things that have a good report, things that have virtue, Things that have praise, worthy of praise. For if you do these things, the Bible says, the peace of God that passes all understanding will be yours by Christ Jesus. But Paul isn't the one that started that. Go all the way back to King David. 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 years ago in Psalm 105. What's this? You got it? Here's what David said. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of all his wondrous works. That's what he was telling his people when they were in the middle of battles and they were surrounded by their enemies. He didn't say get mad, go to court, fight it out, talk about it, get depressed. He said, we're surrounded. There's no way out. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to sing. We're going to sing to him. We're going to sing hymns to him. We're going to talk about his wondrous deeds instead of talking about how bad the government is or what our neighbor did to us or what 
the black man or the white man or the Asian man or the Hispanic or the alien did to us. We're going to talk about him who never failed anybody. Talk about the one that's been better to us than we've been to ourselves. Talk about the one who daily loads us with benefits, who loves us with an everlasting love and will never let the enemy take advantage of us again. Talk about what Jesus has done. Let me just ask you this, and I'm getting wound up. I'm sorry. I'm getting wound up. When was the last time you just sat down and talked about the goodness of the Lord? When was the last time you gave your testimony about how he delivered you out of darkness into his marvelous light? When was the last time you said, I don't want to talk about that. I want to tell you what the Lord has done for me. He kept me out of hell. He's kept me out of the hospital. He's kept me out of destruction. God has been good to me. God has been good to me. Do you hear what I'm telling you? God has been good to me. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Stand up. <laughs> you know, I get tickled at some of y'all. You wanted to move when the music was going. You were kind of going like this. <laughs> and then when I'm preaching, some of you want to say something, but it's okay. Hey, look what God has done for all of us. Where would we be had it not been for the Lord in our life? It's okay to say amen. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. It's all right to raise your hands. He's alive. One of these days, I'm going to preach the last sermon on this earth. But I'll never die. One of these days, You'll either come by, my family will either come by and look at my jar <laughs> or they'll look in a big old casket. I don't know. If it's a jar, have them make it up in the mountains at that pottery we like. <laughs> big old nice jar in there. If it's a box, I don't really care. I won't even be here. What am I talking about? What a... What a dilemma the child of God has. Look at this. Now, if he lets me stay a while, here's what I get to do. I get to go to more birthday parties for grandbabies. I get to hug more of my children more often. If he lets me live, I get to go home with her and eat together and talk drink coffee look at the birds well we got birds around our house she puts out all these bird boxes and Lord Jesus and she keeps a book in her hand beside her Bible she said oh what bird is that I think it's I'm trying to drink coffee and she said you ever seen that bird before no I I, I haven't seen it What a life. Man, I am a charmed guy. I get to go out and eat with friends. I get to lie down in a clean bed at night with a nice roof over my head. I get to come here and have you sweet people be so kind and complimentary to us. Man, this is a charmed life. Who would want to leave this? But when he calls me, I get, to go, I get to go stand in a brand new body, knowing I'll never be tempted again. See, where I'm going to live, there is no crime. There are no elected officials. There's just one. His name is Jesus. All because he lives. Would anybody like to rear back and help me sing a song right here? Would you? 
I know this is 1158. You still got 15 minutes to get to your appointment. Sing it. Glory. David will sing it. <clears throat> sing it one more time. If you're not sure about your standing with the Lord, if death still threatens you, looms over you, if you're uncertain about the future, while we're singing, I'd like to invite you to come down and let me pray with you. And if there are lots of you, we've got all kinds of people to pray with you. Listen to me. You can be saved in two seconds. You can be ready to die in two seconds. The Lord Jesus can give his life to you in two seconds. So feel free. We've all done it. We've all done it. You might as well get in on it too. Amen. One more time. Enjoy your family. Enjoy every breath. Enjoy the life God has given you. The Lord be with you every step of the way. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Happy Resurrection Sunday. <laughs>